Praise the Lord, Bethlehem Baptist. day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. My brothers and sisters in Christ, I greet you in the name of our Lord and Savior. Yeah. Our congregational hymn will be this hymn up.
There's one announcement that I need to make on Wednesday, September 1st, Bible study resumes at 7 o'clock p.m. via Zoom. The Zoom link is on the church website. All additional announcements can be found in your bulletin. We are now have our offertory prayer from the, I'm sorry, from Deacon Walter Ben, followed by a scripture from Sister Lisa White, and then we'll have the prayer by Reverend Roberta Anderson and that order. Good morning, Dr. Ham. Would you take your over in your hands and hold it the book a little bit? All gracious Heavenly Father, thank you for allowing us another opportunity to worship and learn about what you want us to do. Lord, continue to strengthen us and let us go in the right direction. Lord, bless us this day and forevermore. This I ask in your precious and everlasting name. Amen. Amen. Verses 38 through 42. Mark chapter 9, verses 38 through 42. When you have found it, please say amen. And John answered him, saying, Master, we saw one casting out devils in thy name, and he followeth not us, and we forbid him because he followeth not us. But Jesus said, Forbid him not, for there is no man which shall do a miracle in my name that can lightly speak the evil of me. For he that is not against us is on our part. For whosoever shall give you out a cup of water to drink in my name, because ye belong to Christ, verily I say unto you, he should not lose his reward. 42. And whosoever shall offend one of these little ones that believe in me, it is better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck, and he, and he were cast into the sea. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his holy word. You may be seated. We pray, Heavenly Father, for healing 
for our sick, for our shut in, for those, oh Lord, who are shut in but not shut out. We pray, Lord, for healing power to flow from you to each one of us. We lift up, oh Father God, those that we do know. We lift up Brother Stanley Brown, Lord, that you may prepare him for whatever it is he may have to face and his family, that they know there's no mountain too high, no valley too Lord, we lift up not only the Brown family, we lift up those that we've lost along the way. Because even though, Lord, their presence is not here, their memory lingers on and on. We lift up the families in this church, Lord, who've had to say goodbye for a while to a loved one. We lift up, oh Father, the Ford family. We lift up, Lord, the Jefferson family. Lift up, oh Father, the family of Sister Rosa Allen. And Lord, as we lift up these people, that we know that we love, that we know that you love them more. Bless them to know that, Father, you are the mighty healer who can do all things. Lord, we lift up those today that have been on the battlefields of war and left us so tragically. We pray, Father, for their families. We lift them up. We pray, Father God, right now that we call upon your name. And Lord, we just ask in the name of Jesus, teach us, oh Lord, teach us to do your will. For your word says, thy will be done here upon this earth as it is in the heavens. Teach us, Lord, to do for others with love and honor for us. Because you loved us more, more than we even loved ourselves. Father God, we pray for the people we pray for those that are warriors of faith and just keep enduring and persevering because, Lord, you bless them with what they need. And, Lord, we pray this morning for the word that is to come forth, the word, Father, from the messenger who has come forth to deliver your word. We ask, Lord, that you bless him, anoint him even, Lord, that we might hear this the word and Father God, as hearers, that we become doers of your word. I pray this day, Lord, that our steps, our steps will be ordered in your word. And Father God, I just ask these and all things right now in the mighty, mighty name of Jesus we pray. Let the church say, Amen.
Let us look to the Lord now for a word of prayer. Father God, holy and righteous, again we stand behind the sacred desk, calling upon your power from on high, that you might anoint me as your manservant afresh and anew, cover me from the crown of my head to the sole of my feet, and mark me as a vessel that might be used to your honor and to your glory, allowing me to accomplish those things which you intend. Father, we pray for this, your waiting congregation. We pray that you have been uh, ministering to them throughout the course of this week, that as your word goes forth, it might indeed fall on fallow ground, that it might take root and grow to full fruition. Father, I pray that you would bless us even now through the preaching and teaching of your holy word. And we ask these blessings in the precious and the powerful name of your son, Jesus. And let God's people say together, Amen. Amen. We're going to start with a story about an old preacher. Uh, this old preacher, he was standing before his congregation, and he had a member of his congregation that was a little bit more financially well off than the rest of the congregation. Now, nobody in this congregation would have been considered wealthy by any means, but this one particular gentleman by the name of John uh, was doing a little bit better than some of his neighbors. So pastor decided to use John as an example. So uh, he calls out to John. He says, John, if you had 100 pigs, would you give 20 to the Lord? And John was like, of course, pastor. You know I would. And pastor said, well, John, if you only had 50 pigs, would you give five to the Lord? And John was like, of course, you know I would. Then uh, the preacher asked, well, John, if you had only two pigs, would you give one to the Lord? And John said, Pastor, you know I only got two pigs. Stop playing around. <laughs> and that is the case with many of us when uh, it comes to utilizing what you actually have on hand. We become a bit more cautious about what we are willing uh, to give unto the Lord. Uh, uh, Tony Evans, a uh, preacher down in Texas at a big mega church down in Texas, uh, he tells a story um, about how he doesn't like any store with the name Mark in it. Uh, and unfortunately, on this particular <clears throat> morning, uh, he had to make a run to Walmart. Uh, so he was a, a bit frustrated by the fact that he had to go there, so he decided to go early in the morning, hoping that there wouldn't be any cars in the parking lot. But to his surprise, when he arrives at Walmart, uh, the parking lot is overflowing. So. Uh, he has to get what he needs, so he goes in and uh, picks up the items that he's looking for, and he makes his way uh, to the register uh, to check out. And come to realize when he gets to the register uh, that there was a big sale going on at Walmart, and that's why the parking lot was overflowing. And he says while he was standing in line, he came to a realization that it is, so it is with God's people, that when uh, God is not asking too much for, from us, and uh, there aren't too high of expectations. Uh, uh, God has the sale price advertised, uh, then the parking lot seems to overflow. But when the sale ends, uh, the numbers seem to dwindle down. And uh, that's the title of our message for today, when the sale ends, when the sale ends. Now in our text this morning, we find John, relaying a story to Jesus about a man who was casting out demons in Jesus' name. But he was not a part of their group, uh, the, tip, the group that typically or regularly traveled with Jesus. Now, just so that some of you can have some context about what's going on here in this passage, please allow me to share a little bit of uh, background information about how we got to this point uh, where John is telling Jesus this particular story. Just a few verses earlier, in this very same chapter of Mark's Gospel, we find in verse number 14 that the Bible says, When they came to the disciples, they saw a large crowd gathering around them, and the scribes disputing with them. When they came to the disciples, they saw a large crowd gathering around them, and the scribes disputing with them. Now prior to verse number 14, Jesus and a few select disciples they had been up on the mountaintop, and they were having a, a unique mountaintop experience. Anybody in here know what it is to have a mountaintop experience? 
This is one of those grand and glorious times with the Lord. But there comes a time when you have to leave off the mountaintop and go back down into the valley to serve. Are y'all with me so far? So now I want you to understand that the they that came to the disciples in, number first, in verse number 14, that they is Jesus and that small select group of other disciples who had been with him up on the mountaintop. And I want you to put a pin in your, your journey on your map here because we're going to come back to this point in just a moment. But first I need you to see this picture in your mind. Jesus and three of his disciples, they walk up to the rest of their group. And their group is in a heated argument with some scribes. The scribes, these are the religious scholars, the learned men, the trained teachers of the law. And some of them, Jesus more, uh, more commonly, or they were some of Jesus' most common and regular detractors. So Jesus walks up on his disciples there, arguing with the group that he is always having some issues and problems with. And yet, here we find them, and they're arguing with the nine disciples who were not with Jesus on the mountaintop. And, I, and can you see this picture in your mind? Or, or think about it like this. Say, for example, you were a high school student at a football game, and you're playing against your school's biggest rival. And even if your uh, school might not be playing football this season, or if you've been out of school for more than 20 years or more, I'm sure that you can still picture this in your mind. You and a few of your friends, you're coming from the concession stand to find the rest of your group arguing with some students from the other school. It doesn't matter what type of group that you rolled with in high school, whether you were a cheerleader or a band member, a football player or a member of the chess club. I think you can understand what I'm talking about. You roll up and your crew is arguing with some other crew, and even though you don't know what's going on, what you do know is which side of the argument you're going to be on. You may not know what they're arguing about, but you do know that you want to get involved and find out what's going on. Is there anybody in here that can see that picture in your mind? So Jesus, he rolls up and he asks the disciples in verse number 16, what are you arguing with them about? And on top of all of that, you know how people do when they see a group argument going on in a public setting. So we find in verse number 15, where the Bible says, and all of a sudden, the whole crowd saw him and they were amazed and all ran to greet him. The crowd is gathering there and watching and waiting for something to happen, for something to jump off. And then all of a sudden they see the group leader coming up the road and they get all excited and they go running up to Jesus. It is only in Mark's gospel that the word translated amazed is found when describing this particular encounter. And that term is intended to convey an intense emotion. Mark is quite intentional in seeking to show the emotion, the fervor of the situation in which Jesus and his inner circle walk up to. And it is while in the midst of this intense emotional situation, the Bible says in verse number 17, out of the crowd, one man answered him, teacher, I brought my son to you. He has a spirit that makes him unable to speak. And then verse number 18 continues, wherever it seizes him, wherever it seizes him, it throws him down and he foams at the mouth and grinds his teeth and becomes rigid. So I asked your disciples to drive it out, but they couldn't. I asked your disciples to drive it out, but they couldn't. When we began, John was telling Jesus a story about a man who was casting out demons. Lord have mercy. He was telling the story about this man who was casting out demons, but he was not a part of the group that traveled with Jesus. And now here, just a few verses previous, John has witnessed and experienced this intense emotional situation where his buddies, his fellow disciples, they're faced with this very same task and they are unable to perform it. What's going on here? The disciples certainly should have been able to perform the task. In Mark chapter 3 and verse number 14, the Bible says, and he also appointed 12, and he also named them apostles to be with him, to send them out to preach. And in verse number 15 goes on to say, and to have authority to drive out demons. It's explicitly stated right here in the Bible. If you go down to verse number 15 of that same chapter 3, verse number 7, or excuse me, verse number 7 of chapter 6 says, He summoned the twelve, and he began to send them out in pairs, and he gave them authority over unclean spirits. According to Scripture, it seems clear to me that it is one of the primary responsibilities of those whom Jesus has chosen to have authority over unclean spirits, to be able to drive out demons. Y'all still with me? It's all right to say amen. So, let us add another layer to this seeming discrepancy. 
John is not only aware that the disciples' responsibilities uh, include casting out demons, but John has also witnessed his buddies fail at this very task. And yet and still, it is John who is telling this story to Jesus about this other man who was casting out demons in Jesus' name. It is this John who was also part of Jesus' inner circle, those who got to go up on the mountaintop with Jesus. This is the Apostle John, the brother of James, the son of Zebedee, the one who was described as the disciple whom Jesus loved. In Mark, verse, in Mark chapter 3, verse 17, the Bible says, and Jesus, and the Bible says, and to James, the son of Zebedee, and to the brother John, Jesus gave the names Oanagarius, which means son of thunder. <laughs> that term has been translated as heavenly twins or sons of Zeus. The gospel writer Mark, when he gave us the meaning of sons of sons of thunder, he did not explain why it was appropriate. However, the name might be indicative of the thunderous temperament that these brothers apparently possessed. And, and, and why, all, why is all of this significant? It's to demonstrate to you that John was very much a part of Jesus' inner circle. And if anyone should have known what Jesus expected as a, from his disciples, it should have been John. It's all right to say amen. amen. But to further illustrate this point, I want us to also look at whom else was up on the mountaintop of Jesus. Not only was John there, but also his older brother James, the other son of thunder. These guys were so close to Jesus that in chapter 10, they would come and ask Jesus if they could sit on his right and on his left when he established his kingdom in glory. In addition to these two who were there with Jesus was also Peter, whose name means rock. It was Jesus himself who changed Peter's name from Simon to the rock. And I would guess that, that I got one or two folk in here this morning that, that know a little something about this particular apostle. He was the most vocal spokesperson for the disciples. It was this disciple who walked on the water with Jesus. It was this same Peter who would first proclaim that Jesus was the Messiah, the Son of God. Now, there are multiple concerns or multiple occurrences of when Jesus would only allow these three, Peter, James, and John, to accompany him. But we are only going to explore for a moment just this one occurrence where they're coming down from the mountain as we find described at the beginning of chapter 9 in Mark's Gospel. That's because this particular occurrence is relevant and it pertains directly to the situation that we're going to be exploring this morning. So, a little bit of additional background information. If you back up to verse number 2 of chapter 9, the Bible says, After six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John, and he led them up on a high mountain by themselves to be alone. And he was transformed in front of them, and his clothes became dazzling, extremely white, as no wanderer on earth could whiten them. And Elijah appeared to them, and Moses, and they were talking with Jesus. Then Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah, because he didn't know what he should say, since they were terrified. And then a cloud appeared overshadowing them, and a voice came from the cloud, This is my beloved son. Listen to him. And then suddenly looking around, they no longer saw anyone with them except Jesus alone. Although three out of the four gospel accounts include this record or this story in their train, or <clears throat> let me say that again. Although three out of the four gospel accounts recorded in our Bible, recorded in our Bible include this story of the transfiguration of Jesus, each of the three all convey the voice from the cloud with some different wording. Here in Mark's account, I believe, upon a comparison of what was said and what was left unsaid, that Mark intended to place a clear emphasis on the phrase, listening to Jesus. Mark is intentional in his, this endeavor because Mark's gospel, uh, he wants to particularly focus on Jesus as a servant. This is the primary theme throughout Mark's gospel, to, to portray Jesus as a servant. And by extension, to, so too must we as his disciples all also be servants. Amen? Amen? That includes disciples in the Bible, and that includes you and I as disciples here in the world today. The inner circle has seen and experienced the glory of God, the Lord revealed on the mountaintop. They have had the distinct privilege of being with Jesus in this most intimate time of preparation for Jesus as he is preparing for his pending death on the cross. 
They have been right there with him as God's voice comes down from heaven and gives them specific instructions. So how is it that Peter misinterprets what the correct response was in this situation? And then when we get down off the mountaintop, the disciples, they can't cast out demons from the man's son. And John, the son of thunder, he wrongly stops a servant from casting out demons in Jesus' name and, and must be rebuked by Jesus. What in the world is going on with these disciples? And most particularly with those who were actually a part of Jesus' inner circle, those who, who were the closest to Jesus himself. Well, I'm glad you asked, because I think our text, it can shed some light on the challenges faced by the Bible characters and also for us today as we seek to walk as Jesus' disciples. In our text, the stranger, he was doing the work of a disciple, the task, the duties, the responsibilities that had been assigned to the disciples to do. He was casting out demons. However, those who are a part of the beloved community, and most specifically those who are within the inner circle, namely John, they had rejected this stranger as the other, the one who was not following us. Now, in your beloved community, how often has it happened that someone who has not been born or raised right here in the community find that they just don't seem or feel like they fit in? I'm certainly not aware of any specific incidences uh, uh, here at Bethlehem, uh, but I do know that, 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 that most churches, uh, it's a challenge to assimilate new members. I certainly hope that no person has been dissuaded from doing the work uh, here at Bethlehem, but I do believe that every church has an inner circle that an outsider may find uh, uh, challenging or even overwhelming to find their way to work into. Now, on the other side of this coin, I believe that we got some people in this community uh, 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 we got some folk in this community, but not here at Bethlehem. Amen. Or maybe at that church up the road somewhere. They consider themselves a part of the community, but they can nary cast out any of demon. They can't say a prayer out loud in public. They can't give a testimony. They can't sing a worship song loud enough for the person standing right next to them to hear them. They are totally devoid of any power. They are devoid of any real connection to our source. Uh, they are totally devoid of any willingness to seek or to pursue after the power or the ability to be able to cast out a demon. Now I have no doubt that those who consider themselves a part of this community, they understand that a strong community certainly enhances the lives of its members. The community is a place of identity. Uh, the people have a sense of belonging because they, they know and uh, they are known and recognized. The community provides protection and support. The community shapes values and provides cultural norms. However, I also know that a strong community is susceptible to some of the inherent risks of a strong community. The expectations and demands of social order can restrict the freedoms and creativity of an individual within a strong community setting. And it is in any specific community that even greater challenge is the apathy that allows someone to believe that they are connected to the community, but yet and still they remain devoid of the power that is inherent to a true disciple. Lord, have mercy. The past ways may not be suitable for the challenges of the future. The strong community may be so focused on itself that it loses the capacity to relate to those outside of the community. Let me see if I can make this a little bit clearer that we might all gain some understanding. Quoted from an article in Christianity Today, the author Thomas Merton, he says in this article, Thoughts and Solitude is the title, he says of a person, a person's true vocation, a person knows when they, a person knows when they have found their true vocation, when they stop thinking about how to live and actually begin to live. Let me say that again. A person knows when he has found his true vocation, when he stops thinking about how to live and actually begins to live. We find our true vocation through thought and life as they become one. So, what is our true vocation as the church, as disciples of Christ, as his servants? The Great Commission says, go ye therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. We are all called to make disciples. It's all right to say amen. amen. So our message today, it clearly indicates that disciples are instructed to and they are even equipped to cast out demons, 
Yet so many in our community are just like those disciples that Jesus found when he came down off the mountaintop. They are arguing about stuff that doesn't even matter, and they can't do the work that they've actually been called to do. Lord, have mercy. And then Mr. Murphy's quote, he informs us that we need to move past thinking about how to be the church and actually start making disciples, actually start being the church. Lord, help us. Thinking about how to cast out demons and start living out the calling. We are to embrace our vocation as the church. Our thoughts and our life as the church actually should become one. The things that we think should be the things that we do. It's all right to say amen. amen. So, the concerns about inclusiveness and exclusiveness are particularly intense for the church. For the church community, it's bound together by not just common interests and our mutual enjoyment, but also by the convictions that we hold about the fundamental issues of human existence. It requires something to be a part of the church. We believe certain stuff. What we believe most deeply, what gives us value and meaning to our existence, under what obligations we choose to live, how we define and achieve the good life, it all makes that much more difficult to be sensitive to and accepting of those who have different convictions. Hmm. So, Jesus has provided us some insight, some instruction that he gives to John. The Bible, picking back up at verse number 39 of our text, Jesus tells John, don't stop him, said Jesus, because there is no one who will perform a miracle in my name who can soon afterwards speak evil of me. For whoever is not against us is for us. And whoever gives you a cup of water to drink because of my name, since you belong to the Messiah, I assure you that person will never lose their reward. It is here that we find the three key points that I want to leave you with this morning, and I want to uh, accurately discern who is uh, actually living out as the church or, or, or as the, the, the beloved community. The first determining factor that we must look for uh, or, or to see is to question whether or not they are actually doing the works of power in Jesus' name. James in chapter 5, verse number 16, it says, Confess your faults one to another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Can the people that you associate with, the people who are a part of your beloved community, can they pray that effectual, fervent prayer of the righteous that avails much? Can they be a blessing to somebody else's life through the prayers that they pray? So as we continue to evaluate disciples and evaluate our role in the church, it says, can your prayers cast out demons? Ephesians 5 and 19 also says, be filled with the Spirit. Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always and for all things unto God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. So, you must ask yourself, can members of our community sing the song of Zion to the glory of God with that anointing that can break yokes and remove shackles and, and soothe the brokenhearted and change lives? Lord, help us. Does your singing cast out demons? Revelations, two and, uh, Revelations 21 and 11 says, And they overcame the accuser by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their own lives even unto death. You must ask yourself, do our disciples share soul-stirring testimonies in word and in deed? Can, can you see the risen Savior in the way that we live our lives and the words that come from our mouth? If that be the case, and we indeed living in the power of God, uh, power and living lives and under the power of God and in the name of Jesus Christ, then Jesus himself declares that such people, such a person, they could not soon afterwards speak evil of Jesus. Or by doing so, declare themselves enemies of Christ. Amen, hallelujah, and glory to God. If you're doing the things that God has called us to do, you are indeed a child of God. And, and if you are doing those things, it's almost impossible, according to Jesus, for you to speak evil of Jesus. So the second key point, as we continue to evaluate our role as a church, our role as disciples, is that Jesus gives us, in his own words, is that whoever is not against us is for us. It's quite an, a common, it is quite a common occurrence across the body of Christ and all throughout the church, capital C church, the church universal, that, that, that so many have art against their brother. I don't like that particular ministry, or uh, I don't like how they do this, or how, how they do that. And, and God says it's, it's time out for that foolishness. And, and if it be the name of Jesus at the forefront of that ministry, then we are on the same team. 
regardless if we agree on every theological issue, regardless if we agree on the church constitutional wording, or, or if we don't like the pastor's preaching style, or, or if we, we, we re, regardless of, of whether we like the music or the worship space, or, 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 or whether, whether we are Democratic or Republican, or, 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 or anything else that might divide us, or the things that we use to divide ourselves, Jesus says that it, if it's in his name, then we are together. If it's in the name of Jesus, then we are together. And I'm here this morning to warn you that we better start acting like we are together lest we be contrary to or at odds with Jesus Christ himself. So, here we find if a person or a ministry has proven themselves or not proven themselves as an enemy of Christ, they have not been speaking evil of his name, but they are indeed operating in the power of his name, and as a result, they have been deployed by Jesus himself to be united with us, then the final key point that we should seek to observe is whether or not this personal ministry has shown kindness towards us because of the name of Jesus. The Bible says in verse number 41, and whoever gives you a cup of water to drink because of my name, since you belong to the Messiah, I assure you, he will never lose his reward. Anyone who gives you a cup of water to drink because of my name, since you belong to the Messiah, I assure you, he will never lose his reward. The first thing that I thought about when I read that verse was rock a Hawk Team Day. rock a Hawk is a, a campground out in Charles City, and my team and I, we took a group of youth there uh, a few years back. And uh, during the event, we got an invitation from some other local churches from the Charles City area, uh, Guildfield and Little Elam. Uh, they had parked together to bring their youth to this same event. And they invited us to come over and eat. Now, just like this week, my family and I just got back from vacation. It was the same situation when we arrived at Rock High. My family and I, we had just gotten back from our vacation. And it was my first time ever attending this event at Rock High. So I had no idea what to really expect. So I arrived with our group to find out that although there was a meal included with our ticket, that meal was only dinner. And we were on our own for food throughout the rest of the time for that day. Now, our volunteers and I, uh, we were working some things out to get our youth some snacks and to get some drinks to hold us over till dinner. But that was truly the hand of God in action when a place for our youth to get hamburgers and hot dogs and chips and drinks and even some dessert free of charge just because we belong to the Messiah, it, uh, it was God providing. And I know that those saints who provided for us on that day, they will never ever lose their reward. Given a cup of water in the region of Palestine, it was a, a basic Eastern courtesy. But Jesus is talking about specifically giving in his name. Many people will often give or help other people out because of a variety of other reasons. Uh, maybe it's the custom or the practice in that particular area. Or, or maybe it just seems like the respectable thing to do. Or, or maybe they're looking for some recognition or some honor. Or maybe they're just being embarrassed not to help out because the situation is so bad. Or maybe they are, are just touched by those who are in need and those who are suffering. However, this reward that Jesus promises, this reward that is promised by Jesus, it is for a specific act, the act of helping a person because that person belongs to Jesus Christ. The reward, therefore, is given for the simplest and humblest of acts, the act of giving water to a thirsty believer. Yet so simple an act done for one of Christ's followers, that will be greatly rewarded. It's all right to say amen. amen. So I'm here this morning to declare that you can provide a cool and refreshing drink to a dry and thirsty land. Our text in verse number 42, it says, Whoever causes the downfall of one of these little ones who believes in me, it would be better for him if a heavy millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea. This verse is a reference back to what initially prompted John to start telling Jesus this story in the first place about this other man who was casting out these demons in Jesus' name, but who was not a part of their group. Uh, in the verse just prior to our text, the disciples had been arguing against one another about who was the greatest in the kingdom. Just like the churches today, thinking that their ministry or their way of doing church is better than some other ministry or some other way of doing church. If any ministry meets the criteria that Jesus has laid out for us today, then we can rest assured that they shall receive their reward. However, 
The idea of helping and refreshing a dry and thirsty land in the name of Jesus is how we might receive our own reward. What must we do? What must we do? How can we receive our reward? Mark 9, verses 35 through 37 says, Sitting down, he called the twelve and he said to them, If anyone wants to be first, he must be last of all and servant of all. Then he took a child and he had him stand among them. And he took and taking him in his arms, he said to them, Whoever welcomes one of these little children, such as this in my name, welcomes me and welcomes whoever and whoever welcomes me does not welcome me, but him who sent me. This little child is indeed the key, the catalyst to your and my reward. Somebody is wondering, what are you talking about, preacher? Well, let me see if I can make this thing a little bit clear. Authentic worship is refreshing unto God and also to the worshiper. Just as much as a cup of water is to a desert traveler. If you would dare to worship God in spirit and in truth, because John 4 chapter John chapter 4 verse 23 says, But an hour is coming, and is now here, when the true worshiper will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. Yes, the Father wants such people to worship him. That is what John was telling Jesus. That is why John was telling Jesus this story about that we began our message with today. And it is my contention that there is no more authentic worship than a little child who has been taught to worship. The little child's faith, their belief, their authenticity is what Jesus lifts up to show these disciples what it is to be great in his eyes and great in the kingdom of God. I believe I got some folk in here that know that they can testify. The saints are always refreshed by a little one engaging in worship. It's why almost every Christian seeks to incorporate their youth or, or incorporate youth and children's ministry into their iteration of church or the way that they choose to do church. It's the reason why we gather here uh, for, 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 for service on a Sunday. But little ones, they must be taught the way. Little ones, they must be taught the way. And thus the warning from Jesus about leading little ones astray. I actually had a chance to see a real millstone when I was in South Africa. It is a big, huge stone that weighs just under a ton, about 1,500 to about 1,700 pounds. Nevertheless, our children and youth must be taught how to pray, the prayers of faith. They must be taught to sing the songs of Zion. They must be taught how to allow their lives and their words to give honor to God. These little ones, be it children, youth, or adults, new believers, learning by watching you. They're learning by watching you. What type of disciple are you? What type of church member are you? What type of contribution do you make to the beloved community? I want to tell a story about this little girl named Caitlin. Caitlin was probably about seven years old uh, back in 1996, which would put her in her early 30s today. So if I saw her today, I doubt that I would recognize her, but I might just because her seven-year-old self is seared into my mind. This was around the time when I had first heard God calling me into ministry. And I was having some, some financial challenges and I was struggling to maintain my studies at Norfolk State. Uh, and that was part of what actually drove me back to God. I was going through so much difficulty and so much trouble. I was like, I need to change how I'm living. And once I made that decision to, to adjust how I was living, to, <clears throat> to start focusing on, on being a good disciple, that's really what led me back to God and, and eventually to a call into ministry. So uh, I, was, I, was, I was driven back to God. And, I, and, and during this time, I was working as a camp counselor for the YMCA. And uh, it was one of the first ministry assignments that God gave me, or one of the first ministry assignments that God gave me was to serve as the devotions leader for a summer camp. So during the day, I would have the privilege of leading the camp songs on the opening ceremonies in the morning. And then during the day, I would have an opportunity to share Bible lessons with each of the groups at some point during the day. And during the closing ceremonies that we would always have, uh, we would conclude with a prayer. Now, I don't remember who it was who asked me what I wanted to do when I finished college, but I remember that I replied that I wanted to be a preacher. And Caitlin's group leader, a uh, wonderful lady, uh, she was supportive and encouraging me during these uh, initial stages of my ministry development. But on this day, I had just had a falling out with my roommate, and I was feeling a bit down. Uh, so the encouragement that I got from Caitlin's group leader, it helped me some. But it wasn't until that closing ceremony that God really indeed touched my life in a manner that I can never ever forget. Caitlin, she volunteered 
to lead our closing prayer. And as she prayed it, it was obvious that she was not new to praying aloud before a group of people and that she had been trained. God touched my heart so much so on that day that some years later I would even preach a sermon titled, When I Saw Jesus, where I preached about how I saw Jesus when that little girl prayed at, at, at someone's request or volunteered to pray. Her sincere and authentic worship through prayer, it was so refreshing for my dry and thirsty soul that the living water that she poured into my life is still bubbling up within me to this very day. That demon of despair that had touched my life, uh, uh, unlike the disciples in our text, Caitlin cast it out through her authentic prayer. Uh, so please know and believe that our little ones, they're watching, they're learning from us. So let us teach them uh, the power of worship in Jesus' name, that they might indeed cast out demons just like Caitlin did for me that day. And whoever gives you a cup of water to drink because of my name, since you belong to the Messiah, I assure you, that person will never, ever lose their reward. So I'll close with this one last small story. Uh, the ushers were passing through the aisle, collecting the offering. And as the offering plate was passing down the aisle, a little girl was sitting there, and she took the offering plate, and she placed it down on the floor, and she stood on top of it. And the ushers looked at her and like, oh, what, what are you doing? Why are you doing that? And she said that uh, in Sunday school, they taught us that we're supposed to give God our whole self. And that's my... <laughs> that we don't want to give God the seal of Christ. We want to give God our wholesale price. The whole seal of Christ. God bless you all. I thank you for allowing me to stand behind the sacred desk and share a word. Come on, bless the Lord. God bless you all.